Well, it's a long ways from Texas. We're here in Utah, just a little ways out of Salt Lake City on the Provo River. Uh, a very interesting piece of water that's been managed well. Just down the road from here, about 30 miles, is the Cabela's at Lehigh, which is south of uh, Salt Lake City. And the man there is a guy that I've known a long time. I've coached him in the U.S. fly fishing team. He's a magnificent fisherman and a great teacher. And you're going to be introduced to him in just a second. And assisting him will be another man that I've learned. Uh, I've actually watched him cast in competition. And here, after 55 years, I've learned a bit about casting from him. He's a young man who is dedicated to the art of casting. And he's going to help you a little bit with getting started with your casting. Guess what? He works for Cabela's, but he doesn't work in the fly shop. He works with figures. He's also got a degree in biology. It's Jeff Wagner. So we're going to have some fun here in Utah. I want you still to remember, we started this in Texas where we caught panfish. And then we kind of moved up and caught some catfish. And just a little bit south of this river is a place where we catch warm water fish here in Utah. You, you can catch walleye, you can catch carp, you can catch bass, even a panfish or two. This is a diverse state and one of the best I know for fly fishing. So let's get started. Let's meet Jeff and Lance on the Middle Provo River. In Thanks, Jack. Welcome to the Rocky Mountains. I'm Lance Egan here with Jeff Wagner, hoping to share a few tips about getting started fly fishing. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate you having me up. We have a beautiful day. We've got bugs coming off the water, and I'm literally looking forward to learning from you and getting to know the stream a little bit better and understanding these fishing techniques as best we can. Should be a lot of fun. Well, Jeff, this is the uh, Middle Provo River. Beautiful, nice little run right here. It starts out nice and shallow. Gets a little bit of depth in this run and heads up into a riffle up above. Looks like we might have a couple of fish working. This part of the river has around four to 5,000 fish per mile. So uh, lots of fish to be had. They're normally quite selective. They're not the easiest fish to catch, but there are certainly no shortage of them available to be caught. Excellent. What kind of fish do we have? We have brown trout, rainbow trout, the occasional cutthroat, and the occasional white fish. And what kind uh, of size do we see? Majority of them are brown trout that are, let's say, 10 to 14 inches. Okay. You see uh, fish in this river that will go over 30 inches, but very, very rarely. Uh, these days, it's tough to catch very many fish over 20, really, but uh, they are here. And the fish that are working here, what do you think we're, uh, we'd be best off to use? What are they working on? Well, we're seeing a few blooming olives around. Uh, lately, we've still had some lingering caddis, so either a little caddis dry fly, a darker body, or a small blooming olive. We usually pick a few fish off the top. Okay. Should we uh, head on out and see if we can pick a fish off? Let's do it. All right. So before we get out on the water, I want to share with you a little tip to make threading your rod a little bit easier. The uh, natural thing to do is grab the end of your leader and start threading it through the guides. While that will work, what tends to happen is as you're threading the rod, inevitably for me, I stand on the leader, stand on the line, I don't pull enough line off the reel, and when you start with the very end of the leader, one, it's very small and hard to grasp, two, if you stand on that line and it slips out of your hand, that leader and all the line fall right back through the guides. So tip number one is to take your fly line, and bend it in half, create a little loop out of it, and thread it up through the guides like this. Now, if we let go of this, or we step on the line, it catches and doesn't funnel all the way back through the rods. So you don't have to do it twice. A really simple tip that makes your time on the water a little bit more efficient. Well, we have these fish rising behind us. They're driving us nuts and we'd really like to catch them. But to make our time on the water a little more efficient, we need to take care of a couple of small things first. One is to take the memory out of our leader. You can see this leader has a little bit of a coil factor or a slinky factor to it. That's normal. Leaders are stored on your reel or in a package and they're coiled. They take a set or a memory. So to get rid of that, since this is nylon, we're going to just warm the nylon up by running it through our hands and or giving it a stretch. You can kind of do that at the same time. And that will make the leader lay much straighter. Leaders are a critical part of our fly fishing because they take the junction from the fly line to our fly and they're clear and they help us fool the fish. 
Leaders also help um, transfer the energy from the fly line into the fly leader and that helps give us a nice delicate presentation on the water. What we're looking for is when we unroll that fly and unroll that fly line, we want it to land on the water nice and soft. We don't want any kinks or coils or anything like that. Each one of these coils will go underneath the water and it'll help sink that leader faster, more quickly than what we want. Absolutely. In fly fishing, leaders are tapered, tippet is level. So you buy spools of tippet, spools come 30 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards of the exact same diameter of material. Leaders come from lengths in say 4 feet to commonly 10 or 12 feet and they taper. They start thick at the fly line end and taper down to the very thin on the fly end. So this is our terminal end where we're going to attach the fly. The thin end helps us fool the fish. It's very thin, virtually invisible. The fish can't see it and it's nice and soft and limp so that the fish can't see our fly, they won't see our fly tied to something that looks like a frozen rope. It's going to look very natural on the water. Whereas the butt section, as Jeff was talking about, gives us stiffness to kick the flies over, helps us cast into a breeze. When you're starting fly fishing, a shorter leader is easier to use than a long leader. The casting stroke and everything else is a little bit easier to learn with a short leader. Now by short, I, would, I call a short leader seven and a half feet, where a nine foot plus would be a little more difficult to cast in a windy situation but will allow for a better presentation. So when you're buying your leaders, for most trout situations on a river, 3x to 5x are the most popular. For very small fly presentations, a 6 or 7x might be necessary. For streamers or some bigger nymph patterns, you might fish a 3x or a 4x. Sometimes even 2x if you're throwing really big flies. So in your arsenal of, uh, of gear you need to carry with you, an assortment of tapered leaders would be very key and an assortment of sizes of tippet. You'll find your leaders are available in, an, in a diameter scale, it's called the X scale. Uh, in, when you're buying a tapered leader, it, that refers to the thinnest part of the leader. So this is a 5X leader, which means that the thin end of this is six thousandths of an inch. It's not really crucial to know except that you want to know that your, fly, your tippet will one, fit through your fly, and two, that it will allow you to present to those fish well. So when you're buying a tippet to match your leader, you need to have a tippet that is either the same diameter as the leader or thinner. You wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense to have your leader taper to thin and then put a thick chunk of leader on the end. So you're always either staying the same on the end or tapering to thinner. So the situation we have here, caddish, fish are rising, they're eating them, what are we going to use? We're going to take this seven and a half foot tapered leader, tapered to 5x, and add a little bit more 5x to give us some more fudge length and a little bit more slack to our presentation. Going to add some 5x tippet to it, maybe two, two or three feet, tie a fly on, and go out here and uh, put a fish in the net. How does that look, Jeff? Looks good. Looks like the caddis we have out here. So now the next step is just to walk right out and start casting, right? Well, we could, or we might want to ease our way into it. Luckily, today we have a few fish rising which has given us an advantage because they're giving away their location. So with that in mind, we know there's some fish in these shallows. So if we wade right out, like I know you and I would not do, we would push all of these fish that are rising and, away and scare them into the deeper pool. They'd stop rising and we'd have to probably get them on the bottom. So what are you looking for? How do you know there are fish rising here? Well, we're watching some of the fish uh, take adult caddisflies and blueing olives off the water. And uh, to a beginning angler, it's a little bit tough for you to recognize the rise forms, but the more time you spend on the water, the more that's going to be easy to see and easy to recognize. You'll find that trout like to live in slower portions of the river. They're not going to live out here in the super fast riffles, fast, fast water. They like to uh, expend as little energy as possible and get the maximum amount of food. So a nice little current seam where two currents are coming together like this is a great fish holding uh, piece of water and hopefully we can stay in real shallow here and throw a couple casts and catch some fish in there. That's great, let's do it. Let's make it happen. First things first, we've got our fly on, our tippet and our leader. We need to pull off enough line to, to make that cast. One of the most common mistakes I see in the fly shop is people that want to pull line off while they're casting. Here's what happens. When I'm pulling line off while I'm casting, it pulls right along this line guide and believe it or not you'll groove the aluminum in your reel right here. One, that costs you a lot of money in fly lines. These fly lines are 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars a piece now. That's not good. It's good for a fly shop, not so good for you. 
but it also groove into your reel to where it damages your reel and damages your fly line faster. So if you can break that habit and pull all the line you need out first, if you need to cast the Texas, pull out enough line to cast the Texas. In this case, we're only gonna cast a few feet, so I'm gonna pull enough line off to make that happen. Then we're gonna execute our cast. So we've got our riffle out here. We've seen a few fish rise. We have some conflicting currents between us and our fish. If I lay a cast straight out here, I'm gonna get drag on my fly immediately. Drag is a word you're going to hear a lot in fly fishing, especially in streams. Drag is anything that makes your fly drift unnatural to the current. So if a fish is sitting behind a rock, he's in a protected little spot, he's got a, a little window where he's feeding all the time and all of his food comes at him at the same speed every day of his life. Same speed, same speed, same speed. All of a sudden we throw a fly out there, our fly could look exactly like the naturals, but because it's not drifting the same speed as he's used to, it doesn't register as food. So getting rid of that drag is critical to our presentation. The first thing you can do to get rid of drag is work on your stream placement, your positioning in the water. Casting all the way across to that riffle across the way isn't going to be very efficient. One, I'm not going to be able to hook a fish over there. Two, I can't get a drift over there. Even though there's fish rising, first thing I need to do is cover these fish that are close to me and then I'll work my way into it. So let's start out by just a simple uh, dry fly cast, false casting back and forth. There's been a fish rising right up here in this riffle. I'm going to pull a little bit of line off, take a couple steps out, and we're going to throw a nice easy cast. Easy to do. Look at that, we've got drag. Our fly is getting pulled downstream faster than the current. That's not good. So to battle that, I'm going to throw a little bit of a tuck. I'm going to give the cast a little bit of extra energy on the final delivery, build a little bit of slack into the cast, and it gets me a drift for a few seconds before I start getting drag. Those few seconds are crucial to catching fish. Fly fishing on a stream is a, is a very intimate setting. You don't really need to cast a long way most of the time. In fact, if you're casting too far, most of the time that's a disadvantage. However, if you can cast far, it makes casting in close even easier. But having said that, most of our fishing is done, I'd say, within 30 or 40 feet. So all we need to really do is be able to cast 30 or 40 feet at a time very accurately and easily. So I'm going to make some short drifts through here, see if we can get another nice fish to come up and eat our dry. If not, we'll switch techniques and see if we can get them a different method. There he is. There he is. You like that one a little better? Nice. Nice little brown. Keep a little pressure on him. Keep our control system. Roll him right into the net. Easy as that. Good fish. Nice job. Beautiful little bugger. Take the hook out of this little guy. He took a nice dark little CDC caddis pattern. Beautiful little brownie. Nice color, typical Provo River fish. Awful beautiful this time of year. Thanks, Mr. Brown. Get him back in the water. Off to fight another day. Beautiful fish. Well, we fished dry flies for a little while. We caught a fish. Upstream dry fly pr proved to be effective. We know there's more fish in that pool, however. The fish have started slowing on their rising. They're not rising as much, getting a little later in the day. So we're gonna employ a little different technique. We're gonna go with a dry fly and a dropper, they call it, or a fly that floats and a fly that sinks. We basically attach the dry fly to the line and you can attach leader to the bend of the hook to a nice little bead head or a weighted nymph that's going to sink down to the bottom. What ends up happening is the dry fly works as our strike indicator, our bobber, if you will. It's up on the surface. If a fish eats it, of course, we're going to see that, just like if you're fishing a dry by itself. But also, you have this little bead head nymph that's sunk below the surface. And if a fish grabs it, they will then pull the dry fly under, and we know we need to set the hook. With this method, we're fishing two water types, on the surface and below the surface. So we have our dry fly, and we have our nymph. Both could catch a fish. Therefore, we're increasing our odds versus the single dry fly. 
If we uh, don't have success with this or not as much as we'd like, we will then switch to two nymphs with a strike indicator. That will put two flies right near the bottom. Again, where trout do more of their feeding subsurface, we're going to get two flies down deep and uh, in increase our odds that way. Let's go see if we can put this theory into effect. All right. Well, we tried this dry dropper downstream a little bit. We uh, fished it through the pool. It didn't work. One of the worst things you can do on river is camp in one run all day long. It's always nice to see new water. One, it exposes you to fresh fish. Two, makes you work different water types and thus kind of takes you to that next level as far as learning to read different types of water. Here we have a nice little riffle leading up to a pool. We're going to try the dry dropper through this riffle, see if we can catch a few little fish and then maybe try, move up to the pool and try it there. Let's put it to use and see if we can get a fish. Going to use all the same techniques. It's going to fish close to me first. And then I'll work my way out into some longer casts. Always covering close first, keep as much of that line off the water as possible. Watching that dry fly for it to do anything unnatural to the current. If it stops, goes under, whatever, we're going to set the hook. One thing we should talk about is the distance between our indicator and flies. You generally speaking want your strike indicator two times the depth of the water you're attempting to fish. So in this case, we're probably, from my point fly, probably four feet or so. We're fishing a pretty shallow bar. You need to adjust that as you get to deeper water or shallower water. The other thing to consider is adding weight. Right now I'm fishing weighted flies that are getting me down. If you have flies that aren't weighted or they're very, very small, oftentimes it's nice to add a few split shot to the line. You can add them above the flies, between the flies, sometimes even on the bottom on a dropper rig. The key is to learn how much weight is enough and how much is too much. That just kind of comes with trial and error and uh, differs based on the size of shot you're going to use. So let's talk about some mending. Mending is repositioning of line. If I throw across this current here, you can see the current grabs my fly line and bellies it and creates drag. That's not good. That fish has been down there looking at food come by him at the same speed all of his life and all of a sudden my flies go by him at warp nine. He doesn't like that. It doesn't register as food to him. So what I need to do is instead of throwing that across and just dropping my rod tip and letting the current belly my line out like this, I need to hold a higher rod and move line, reposition or what we call mend line upstream. So I'm going to throw the cast, then I'm going to throw line upstream creates slack in the system. Now my indicator is going the exact same speed as the current and I get a nice long drag free drift. Mend, going to throw another mend in there, keep my rod high, keep as much line off the water as possible. Hey Lance, how do you know when to throw in a upstream mend or a downstream mend? Well, you can watch the indicator for one. But if you're in an area that's, if you're standing in water that's slower than the water you're going to fish, sometimes you need to throw a downstream mend. If the water between you and where you're fishing is usually faster, then it's generally better to throw an upstream mend. You can mend, it's a good point, you can mend up or downstream, and you have to base that upon the, each particular run. Just because you're nymph fishing doesn't mean you need to mend all day. Sometimes you don't need to mend at all. For instance, if I fish straight upstream here, the current between me and the flies is basically the same speed. So I don't really need to mend. I still need to take up slack, but I don't need to throw slack upstream. So straight up here, no big deal. That's an easy cast. Just like earlier when we were nymph fishing on that bend down below, there was enough slow water at our feet that mending wasn't a big deal. But to reach across currents like this, we really need to throw some slack in that system and reposition that line. Notice that when Lance is making a mend, he lifts his rod up a little bit higher. He clears the line from the water, and that allows him to have less resistance to the fly line against the water to be easily able to throw that line upstream. Great point. We throw line up and at the indicator. A lot of people just flick line upstream here. That helps, but it's not as good as, as Jeff described it, lifting. You kind of do a lift and drop. Lift line, get it elevated, move it upstream get rid of some of that stick that way that the line has or the, the water has on that line, the surface tension has on the line. There's the bottom, big bottom. Mending line. 
<clears throat> Gonna kind of creep our way along, moving upstream. We have to watch our shadow. My shadow kind of extends out into the current. So I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Try and fish in front of my shadow first. Lance, what are you doing when you're flipping your wrist at the bottom of the stroke? I'm setting the hook at the end of the stroke just to see if there's a fish there. Oftentimes, when you're out of touch, especially at the end of a drift, there's a fish that has your fly and you don't even know it. So by just giving it a little yank, you can find out. The other thing it accomplishes is it pulls the flies up in the water column and really gets your flies up in the surface to where you can recast them very quickly and easily. So again, this is a very easy drift. Just throwing the rig upstream, following the indicator, leading with the rod downstream. Follow it through. Watch that indicator. If it does anything unnatural to the current, I'm going to set the hook. Fish this little drop off here. So what about rod position? Right now your rod's parallel to the water. Where should it be? What's the right position and why? Well, the right position is, is leading with the, the flies, but anywhere uh, down low, if your rod's way up high, you don't have much room to set the hook. So if you could avoid that, I would recommend it. But it, you could sometimes high stick by lifting line off the water. That's not a bad technique. So long as your, line, your rod tip is downstream of the indicator or downstream of the flies, you should get a quick positive connection. Okay, nobody in that part of it. Let's slide up a little bit. I'm going to employ our roll cast here. Roll cast is a great cast to use when you're nymph fishing. You can use the water tension to help load the line, load the rod. Slide up along this edge. We're hoping for somebody to grab hold of our stone fly in that water. Keep working our way up. So Lance, tell me about how heavy your flies are. Are they next to the bottom? Are they near the surface? Where are they floating right now? Where do you want them to be? Great question. The flies should almost always be as close to the bottom as possible when you're nymph fishing. There are times when you'll see fish elevated in the water column eating nymphs or emergers, but for the most part, if you can get your flies down near the bottom, you'll be most successful. The key with this, again, just like dry fly fishing and dry dropper, is eliminating drag. If I tried to fish a cross current over here, my fly line lands in this faster water and it pulls my indicator downstream faster than the current that I'm trying to fish. So if I was going to try and fish this seam on the other side, I need to make a cast and lift all the line off I can to try and get a better presentation on that far side. So here we are lifting all the line off the water. Let's keep sliding up here. Trout do 90% of their feeding subsurface. You've heard me say that before, but it's important to know because anytime you can get your flies down below the surface, you're likely to be more successful. So here we are still sliding up this run, fishing this edge, taking up slack as it comes to us. If I don't strip this line in, if a fish grabs hold, I've got too much slack between the rod and the flies and I won't be able to set the hook. So we're moving along. Another important thing is to cover water. If we camp in one spot all day long, we're showing our, even if there's fish there, we've already shown those fish our flies. So you can keep doing that, but it's kind of repetitive and not doing you a lot of good. I like to instead keep covering water. So we'll move through this. If it doesn't produce, we'll find another run that might. Okay. So how close to the fast water will you get? Will the fish be in that really fast kind of white water there? There's a fish. Oh, nice. Right on the edge. He's trying Good to get job. Me. Oh, he's trying to get me wrapped up in the sticks. Look at that. Good fish, too. Decent little brownie in the net. That was a perfect spot for a brown to be laying right up on that edge of the fast water, as Jeff was describing. He took our stone fly. Barbell's hook comes out easy. Thanks, friend. Beautiful brown trout. Get him back in the water for another day. Good job. That's how you do it, huh? That's what we're looking for. <laughs>
All right. So that was perfect. We didn't find many fish down in this lower reach. We thought we might. There's no way to tell for sure till we try it. So we covered the water. When it didn't happen, we kept moving upstream right on that seam close to the faster water. We found our fish. Now, why was he there? Jeff was alluding to that just a minute ago. We have fast water on our right bank, a little bit of a seam, let's call it, the mesh between the slower water and the fast, and then our shallow edge. That fish was in the seam where the two slow and fast currents combine. That's a classic spot for a trout. He has oxygen, he has shelter nearby, deep, fast water, but he also has lots of food on a shelf where he can feed rice to, to uh, adult insects or take nymphs as they come by. Let's get back to it, see if there's any more fish in here to be had.